You may not realize it, but you use mathematical models every day. Something as simple as the weather forecast is actually a complex model based on countless data points. Today, prediction models are critical to coronavirus planning. COVID-19 is still new, and it's hard to anticipate how it will spread and whom it will affect. Models can give scientists, government officials and doctors previews of how to stop the virus and save lives. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones and to some extent I've contributed to prediction models today by getting tested, just like all the anchors here. It's a precaution. But those tests on individuals are costly. A researcher in Wanda came up with an efficient alternative. In the battle against the pandemic, Rwanda's coronavirus task force relies on comprehensive contact tracing. To get an up-to-date picture of how much the coronavirus has spread, Rwanda tests a cross-section of the population regularly using an ingenious strategy called pool testing. The brains behind the strategy is Wilfred Nadifon, a professor at the African Institute for Mathematical Science. If you go to the community and test people, it doesn't tell you how many people are actually infected, right? Because you can test everybody. So you always sample. And so to go from the sample to the truth, to reality, you need mathematical models. The calculations involve complex algorithms. Ndifon has translated them for us into an example from everyday life. The idea behind pool testing is really simple. So imagine that you have nine cups of beans and you are told that one of those cups has bad beans. And in order to check which cup has the bad beans, you must cook the beans and taste. So you might find that the beans uh, taste bitter. Those who have cooked beans, they know that it takes a long time for beans to get uh, well cooked. And so you use a lot of gas if you're doing nine, cooking nine pots of beans. To avoid this effort, the mathematician resorts to a simple yet efficient trick. He combines bean samples from different pots. If all the beans in this pool are good, he no longer has to test each pot individually. Only if there are bitter beans in the sample must he perform additional tests. The principle can be applied any time groups are tested, and it can be used to combat COVID-19. In Rwanda, sets of 10 and 20 samples are combined and tested simultaneously. If the pool test result is negative, all the subjects in the pooled sample are indicated as not having COVID-19. But if the pooled result is positive, each sample is retested individually. The advantages of the pooling approach is just uh, to reduce the cost uh, spent to the, for the reagents, to reduce the turnaround time, feedback for results, and also to test massively uh, in the community or also the group which are just uh, which are just concerned for the COVID-19. So those are the main advantages for this. If the virus has spread dramatically, pooled samples test positive too often, and retesting becomes costly and time-consuming. So far, however, Africa has low number of cases compared to Western countries, and the method is proving useful there. This is really helpful for the African countries, but not only African countries, even for developing countries, since we developed this and published the uh, polling approach in the NYCHA paper, so we have been approached by several countries. Ghana and Kenya are now applying the strategy to mass testing. Inquiries have also come from the US. And in Britain, the University of Edinburgh is testing students with this method. Oliver Ratman is a lecturer in statistics in the Department of Mathematics at Imperial College London. Uh, welcome to our program. And before we get into the nitty-gritty of mathematical modelling, just very, very briefly, what exactly is it that you do at your department? Hi, thanks for having me today. So I'm part of the uh, Imperial Co um, College London COVID-19 response team. And we've looked at, you know, um, various kinds of infectious disease models to inform on public health responses to the epidemic. I guess the, the first and probably one of the most important pieces was where we kind of planned out scenarios on what would prevent um, hospitals to collapse and what prevent 
hundreds of thousands of deaths in the population. So that was the first one, and we showed that social distancing, um, general lockdowns, um, capping of non-essential services are really fundamental to that. Uh, later on, we looked at the age groups that sustain the epidemic, showing that it's primarily the 20 to 49 year olds that drive spread, 70% um, of all transmissions occurring from those individuals with limited um, uh, contributions from school age children. And, and more recently, we looked at the spread of B117 um, in England and P1 in Brazil, and we showed for B117 that it's uh, uh, by a factor of 1.5 to 1.6 more transmissible than right. the current variants that are currently um, circulating. When you say you look at all these things, what exactly does this mean? I mean, talk us through the process, for example, of what you've been doing in Brazil. So, well, we start by, you know, analyzing the, the, the real um, real time data as it comes in and is reported. So in this case, it's a uh, case data. Uh, initially, it was case data from, from Manaus, hospital data, um, so just number of admissions, um, a number of deaths, burial data, um, as sad as it sounds. Um, as you know, it's been horrific in, in, in the Amazon. Um, and then we try to interpret, interpret this data um, with mathematical models. So these are um, non-linear models. So they are, it's a little bit unintuitive to, uh, to work with them. It's not like um, I throw you a ball and you know where it lands. So, so we really need these models to help us understand what's going on. And, and how do you translate those models that are not linear uh, for policymakers to understand what's going on so that they can decide on specific measures? Well, we show, you know, the, um, the fits to the data um, itself, along with 95% uh, credible intervals to measure uncertainty. We show forecasts, you know, various what if scenarios, and there is no uh, single forecast, right? Um, um, but, but there are different scenarios. What would happen if, you know, if mobility were to reduce in the population? What, you know, and, and other things. Um, and, um, and then based on that, you know, based on that communication and verification from several teams, different analysis from different regions, um, ultimately decisions be, are being made at a policy level. I mean, let, let's uh, take a con concrete example, because here in Germany, uh, there's a lot of discussions right now. Politicians are talking about how to end the lockdown. Now, if German Chancellor Angela Merkel came to you and asked you what happens uh, to the infection rate if we were to open schools and restaurants next week, could you provide her with a model? Oh, you know, um, uh, yes, so that is what we've been doing like day in and day out for the past year for the uh, British government. Um, and it's just not us, but it's uh, uh, more than 10 other modeling teams and institutions across the UK who come together and feed back into this. And, and so it's, uh, um, it's a very busy, it's been a very busy period. I bet. Uh, but are they actually then taking... Uh, well, you're not giving advice, you give them a model. So uh, they still have to sort of figure out what it means and make the right policy decision. Uh, can you support them well, we somehow? We may be trying to make this, sorry to interrupt, but we're trying to really make this as, as transparent and, and easily accessible as possible. So, you know, we give them graphs and we give timelines and, and projections. Um, and confidence is built by having very similar answers from very different types of models um, and being also transparent about the assumptions that undergo, you know, and underline all these models. All right. So it, you're inexpensive these days, certainly. But when the pandemic is over, if it's over one day, what models would you like to work on? Well, you know, like the COVID-19 is not the only infectious disease out there in the world. In fact, like I'm, you know, primarily working on, on HIV. There's, uh, uh, you know, many other diseases. Um, you've heard about avian influenza in the first cases, you know, first human transmissions um, um, already happened this year. So uh, there's no shortage of problems to, to work on. Uh, I'm afraid you're right, yes. <laughs> Oliver Ratman from uh, Imperial College in London. Thank you so much for your time. Switching cognitive gears now. You'll see what I mean. Over to Derek. How much of the population has to be vaccinated before we reach herd immunity? Everyone wants to know this number, which from the start has generally been estimated at roughly 70% of the population. Um, the problem 
is that pinning it down exactly isn't possible yet because there's still so many moving parts in this pandemic. Um, two of the most important factors that can have a major impact on herd protection are still big question marks. Um, the first is the extent to which people who've been vaccinated can still potentially catch and transmit the disease even if they never develop symptoms themselves. Um, the data we have so far on this aspect is, is quite positive. Evidence from a couple of larger studies now in peer review indicates that at least some approved vaccines appear to help lower a recipient's chances of being a transmitter after being vaccinated, maybe dramatically. The second factor that plays a key role in how soon we reach herd protection involves variants. Um, when the virus mutates to become more transmissible, people who get it grow more contagious, so they give it to more people on average. Um, and that makes achieving herd protection more difficult. Um, another potentially problematic facet of this problem is that, that variants can also mutate in ways that lower existing immune protection to SARS-CoV-2, whether for those who've been vaccinated or for those who've had the disease. So variants could turn people we thought were protected back into potential infectors. Um, despite the imponderables, many see falling case numbers in countries with high vaccination rates as evidence that herd protection is already beginning to influence the course of the pandemic. But we won't really know we have it until we get there. That's it. Thanks for watching.